Hello and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you have decided to join us for our time of worship as we grow in God's Word together. Today, we're hearing from our brother, Peter Chu. Join us as we explore the question, what is our response when God says no, further by looking at the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. So several weeks ago, we looked at the story of Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham. And we learned that when God sees us, He's more than aware of our existence. When He sees, He cares and He acts. We also considered the question, what is our response when God says no? In the story of Sarah and Hagar in Genesis 16, God says no to both of them. And today, I would like to explore that question further by looking at the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah's story shares many elements in common with the story of Sarah and Hagar. The story is set in the time of the judges. Israel's in the promised land, Joshua has died, and Israel's ruled by a succession of judges. Now, Israel is a complete mess. They are caught in this spiral of rebellion against God, God's judgment through oppression by foreign nations. Israel cries out to God. God hears their cry, raises up a judge who delivers them, and restores the nation to their relationship with God. But as soon as the judge dies, they repeat it again. Now, It's a spiral instead of a circle because each starting point, Israel is lower morally and spiritually than they were with the last judge. Israel is far from the holy nation, the royal priesthood, and the mediator of blessing to all the other nations that God intended her to be. But God is still faithful to Israel. He is setting in motion a plan that will return Israel to him and free them from the oppression of the Philistines. His plan centers on two women and two boys. The first woman is Ruth, the ancestor of David. The second woman is Hannah and her son Samuel. The story begins, there was a certain man from Ramathayim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Yoroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. A four-generation genealogy is unusual in the Old Testament. Usually, you're given the name of the character and just their father, David, the son of Jesse. When you're given four generations, the author is telling us, the reader, do a little digging. Find out who this family is. And when you dig, you find in 1 Chronicles 6 that Elkanah is actually from the tribe of Levi. He's a Levite. He's part of the tribe of priests that had been set apart to serve God and the nation of of God. He was a Levite who lived in Ephraim. So he was an Ephraimite by address, not by ancestry. The fact that he is a Levite will become important later on in the story. What do we know about his family? He had two wives. One of them was called Hannah. She's named first, so she's the first wife. And the other, Penina. Then we have the first contrast between the two women. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Notice that when it comes to measuring by children, Penina's name comes first. Hannah's come second. In the ancient Near East, two things gave women status and esteem and security. Who they married and the children that they had. Now, Elkanah, remember, a Levite, a priest of God, his response when God says no to children from Hannah is he adopts ancient Eastern cultural practice. My first wife 
cannot bear children, I will marry a second wife. He's a Levite. Now, as a reader, we have more questions about, well, what's, what's happening in this family, the dynamics, the relationships? You have two women, two wives, one has children, one doesn't have children. We want to know more because we have a bad feeling about this. But the author doesn't give us any more information. He, he delays it. He instead gives us information about Elkanah's worship practice, annual visits to the tabernacle where he worships God. The, the author tells us about who the priests are. He's just slowing down and delaying the story. He even tells us how every time Elkanah worships, he distributes the meat from the sacrifice to Penina and all her children. And then finally in verse 5, we get back to the dynamics of the family. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. But to Hannah, in contrast to Penina. That's our second contrast. Elkanah loved Hannah, but married Penina to have children. The double portion is evidence of his preferential love for Hannah. The favoritism, as you can imagine, results in rivalry and conflict. What happens next is the author focuses on Hannah, but he gives us a 360 of all the relationships that define her life. The first direction he looks is upward. What is Hannah's relationship with God? We read it in following in verse 5. And the Lord had closed her womb. And then in vain in verse 6, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. The narrator is very firm that her childlessness is from God. Closing Hannah's womb was God saying to her, no. Now, what is our response when God says no as we're waiting on God? We could argue with him. Well, why not, God? It's a very reasonable request. In fact, it's very worthwhile. Why not? We can accuse God of several things. God, you don't love me. You won't give me what I want, what I ask for. Therefore, you don't love me. We can also say to God, that's not fair. You gave this to them. You did this for them. Why not me? God, that's just not fair. Or God, after all that I've done for you, you owe me. Imagine the audacity to say to God, you owe me. I deserve this, but we say it. Now, God invites us to argue, to bring our accusations and our criticism to him. We see that in the Psalms. The psalmist engages with God in some very raw dialogue. So it's not that we can't say things back to God, but as his answer continues to be no, Where do we land? I think we can land in three places. First, we can accept it. And this is not the acceptance of resignation. It's the acceptance in faith that his no is for my good. He still loves me. I have all that I need, so he is saying no because I don't need this. Or we can do the opposite, the other extreme, which is abandon God. God, we're through. We're done. I reject your no. I'm going to find a way to get what I want or be who I want or where I want to go. God, we're through. Or we can land somewhere in between. I'm going to call it acquiescence, but with an asterisk. Here, we accept on the outside. We say the words. But on the inside, we just won't let go of what we're asking God for. We end up disappointed, maybe bitter, maybe angry, resentful. But we won't let it go. The author takes us upward, Hannah's relationship with God. Then he takes us outward. Who's around Hannah? And the first person we encounter is 
the other wife. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Penina is first described as Hannah's rival. Now, the term is more than just competitor. The term refers to an adversary, an enemy, an oppressor, even a tormentor. We read in the NIV, her rival provoked her, kept provoking her. Your translation may have it rendered as provoked her bitterly. And I think provoke her bitterly is more accurate. It is not the frequency of provocation, but the intensity. And let me illustrate. Provoking has the idea of Penina is just poking and poking and poking at Hannah. The end result of the poking, she wants to irritate her. That word doesn't really do justice to her goal. The word actually means to explode, to burst out. Penina is poking, 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 poking until (laughs) Hannah explodes. She can't hold it in anymore and she explodes in tears. That is the picture that the author is giving us. And that happens year after year. What happens is Hannah is robbed of worship because she is so filled with grief and anguish and provocation. Now, in Panina's defense, That annual visit to Shiloh is no walk in the park for her either. Every time Elkanah distributes the food and gives Hannah a double portion, it is a reminder to Penina that she's number two. She has given Elkanah what he wants, children, but he won't give her his love. It's painful for both women. Let's look at Elkanah, verse 8. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Notice that he is asking a series of rhetorical questions. The answers are known. At least in his mind, they're known. And his language of love is to give things to Hannah. So Hannah, I don't know why you're crying, but here, this will make you feel better. Have more meat. (laughs) Elkanah is just missing it. Have more meat. You'll feel better. Can Hannah go to her pastor? Well, if you're a pastor and you see someone come off the street into our church, into the sanctuary, sit in the pew, and they bow their head, and their lips are moving, you don't hear anything, and tears are streaming down their face, you would conclude this person is pouring out their heart to God in prayer. You would pray for them. You might come up to them and pray with them. Eli, you're drunk. In fact, Eli says more than you're drunk. How long will you keep on getting drunk? He accuses her of being an alcoholic. That's his pastoral care. (laughs) It's only when Hannah corrects him. I am deeply troubled. I have not been drinking. I have been pouring out my soul to God. I am not a worthless, wicked woman. Only then does he wake up and be a priest? What about Hannah herself? From verses 7 to 16, the author basically exhausts the Hebrew vocabulary for anguish and heartache. In verse 7, she wept. Also in verse 7, she would not eat. In verse 10, bitterness of soul. 
Again in verse 10, she wept much, misery, deeply troubled, great anguish, grief. As you run through those verses, you see the adjectives that portray where she is on the inside. Why does she have such anguish? Because when God said no, she couldn't let go. If I only have a son, I will be happy. You see, when, when Hannah looks at the pieces of her life, she sees one th- missing piece, and she thinks that piece is having a son, that if she has a son, her life would be complete. She has a husband that doesn't understand her. She has a rival that provokes and torments her. She has a priest that's out of touch and cynical. She has a God who has said no to her. Where does Hannah turn for hope and comfort? She turns to the God who said no to her. She turns to the God who said no to her, and she prays. As you survey the verses, notice the number of times an expression for prayer comes up. She prayed to Yahweh. She kept on praying. She was praying in her heart. She poured out her soul. I have been praying. It is still to God that she turns. And in that prayer... There is a vow in verse 11. She made a vow, a promise, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will be used on his head. Notice the term that she uses to address God, Lord Almighty. We see it already in verse 3, but she incorporates it in her prayer. Now, this phrase is different from God Almighty. God Almighty usually translates El Shaddai, the God who can do anything, the God who will take care of everything. It refers to God's capabilities. He's omnipotent, and he's also omnicompetent. Lord Almighty, your translation may have rendered it Lord of hosts. That captures the idea that God commands everything and everybody. It captures his sovereign authority over all the universe. And it is this name that Hannah uses in her prayer. It is the first time it shows up in the Old Testament, and it shows up frequently in the book of Samuel and Kings. Now, what does she say to God? There's a series of verbs. God, if you will do the following things, if you will only look. The words that she uses are really saying, if you will look hard, look carefully, remember not forget, give a son. What will she do? Then I will give him to you all the days of his life. If you will give me a son, I will give the son back to you. As a Levite, Samuel, her son, would have served God starting at age 25, and then he would retire at age 50. It's a pretty sweet deal, okay? Freedom at 50. What Hannah was offering, if you give me a son, he will serve you his entire life. From the moment of birth to age 25, from 25 to 50, and then from 50 onwards. His whole life. The second thing I want you to notice is, how does Hannah refer to herself in her prayer? What she says is, I am your servant. If you would only look upon your servant's misery, do not forget your servant, but give your servant a son. She is saying three things to God. I submit to your will. I submit to your no. I am your servant. Your purpose, your plan is what I want. 
Secondly, she has surrendered. She's let go of her desire for a son. Third, sacrifice. She has changed the reason why she wants the son. The son is no longer for her, for her fulfillment, her contentment, her peace, her joy. The son is now for God. Now realize, if Elkanah dies, Penina would be looked after by all her children. Hannah, if she has a son, she's given that son back to God. She has to trust God to look after her in her old age. Where Hannah has landed is, if I only have God, I am happy. When she looks at the pieces of her life, what she's realized is, all I need is God. God is the missing piece. And in her vow and in her prayer, she is saying, you are all that I need. Your grace is sufficient for me. And your power is made perfect in my lack. In verse 18, we see the transformation in Hannah. She ate, her face was no longer downcast, and the next morning, for the first time in a long time, she was able to worship. Chapter 2, the first 10 verses, we read Samuel's, uh, Hannah's song, a song of worship and thanks to God. How does she end up with a song when she started off with such sorrow? In the middle, she learns to surrender to God. That song is actually the outline for the entire book of Samuel, and it is the foundation for Mary's song in Luke chapter 1. As Hannah celebrates God's sovereignty and grace in reversing the fortunes of his servants. God provides more children. In chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, we read that he blesses Elkanah and Hannah with three sons and two daughters. When she offered Samuel to God as a young boy, I don't think she ever imagined that God would take that child and, and make him the last judge of Israel and the first prophet in Israel who guided Israel into the time of the monarchy. I don't think she ever imagined that. But God takes that gift and he does something amazing with it. What are the lessons that we can learn from Hannah? First, what is our response when God says no? As we talked about, we are allowed to dialogue with God. We can argue with him. We can bring our complaints to him. He's big enough to handle it. We read it in the Psalms frequently. But as God continues to say no in that conversation, where do we land? We can abandon God. We're done. You don't love me. We're done. I will find a way to get what I want. We can acquiesce. On the outside, we say, okay, I accept what you, your no, but on the inside, we're just seething with resentment and anger. Or we can accept it. But this is an acceptance in faith that you are good. Your love endures forever. And that your no is for my good. I don't need it. It's not good for me. The second question is, what have we substituted for God? What is in our blank? If I only had that position, if we only could live in this neighborhood, if I was in this relationship, if I only had these things, if my health was only better, Hannah goes from, if I only had a son, I would be happy to, if I only have God. We sing, you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Is he really our all in all? 
The third lesson, which was very sobering for me when I figured it out as a young person, was God told me, you know, Peter, I don't really care if you're happy. And I thought, what? I thought it was all about my happiness. God said, no, Peter, I don't really care if you're happy. Peter, what I care about is that you're holy, that you trust me and you do what I tell you to do. Because in trusting me and being holy and obedient to me, Peter, you will be happy. Because my happiness is not based on what happens in my life. It's based on God's goodness and his faithfulness. And then lastly, why should God answer our prayer. When we bring something to God, what will we say when he turns around and says back to us, why should I answer your prayer? What a great reminder of God's word today. If you are feeling led to support and learn more about our ministry, visit us online at livingtruth.ca. You can also call the number on your screen to make a donation. Thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday.